Hello and welcome to Treasure in Every Verse. I'm your host, author and Bible teacher, Kevin Madison. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, friends, we're back and we're going to try to wrap up uh, our, our series where we were talking about this right here. We was talking about God who is spirit, who lives inside of a body, and that the Son in the Godhead and the Son that, that we see, in fact, are the same because the Son is God, and they're different because the Son in the Godhead is invisible. The Son that you and I can see, the visible part of God, is the Son that's being referenced in the Bible. Okay, so let's let's look at this. And I've showed you, I showed you guys this, right? So if you wasn't with us when I explained this through the scriptures, folks, those who are new to the channel, I'll say it for you. I don't go outside of the scriptures. I have no authority whatsoever to say anything that is not 100% scripture base. I don't pull verses out of context. I give you reference after reference after reference because God never leaves himself without a witness. And he said that it takes at least two or three witnesses in the book to show you, in fact, that it's doctrine according to God. There's no controversy in the book. There's nothing said in the Old Testament that refutes something in the New Testament and vice versa. The book is very cohesive. That's the way God intended. He held to himself, God did, some truth. That is, for example, uh, the church. God hid that from people living in the past. Why? I have no idea. Because he wanted to. I, I don't know. I can't explain that because the Bible don't explain it. If he had explained it in the book, outside of saying that he had a specific task for the church to do versus you know, the Old Testament saints, outside of saying what he wanted the church to do, that is to show some things to the angels that he didn't allow people in the past to show to the angels, I don't know. And I'm not going to try to figure it out. Why not? Because if God wanted us to know, he would have told us. So what am, what's my point? My point is, is that the Bible clearly say, and you can go to the references. I'm not going to go back through that. The Bible clearly say that God lives inside of Christ. The Godhead, who is God, lives inside of Christ. The Father, who is made up of the Godhead, who is God, lives inside of Christ. That's what the book teach. Here's your references up here. And it is clear, crystal clear, that that's exactly what the book teaches. Now, it's been a while since we did this. So I'm going to go to, to each one of these at the end of this because I'm going to end right here on this to show you that the Old Testament and the New Testament say the same thing about this person that is him. All right. Now, let's go back to where we stopped yesterday. We stopped here. We were talking about Second Thessalonians. Chapter one, and we were talking about the glory of God and what that looked like, right? And Paul is praying here in chapter one for believers who were going through some trouble. What was what was their trouble? The trouble was they were adhering to the scriptures, and people and the demons started attacking them. They were not popular. Listen, folks, when the truth is taught verbatim from the scriptures, it's never going to be popular, ever. Why? Because sinners hate truth. They love darkness. 
You and I too. We look when when we were before we got born again, true believers. We were just like that. You say, "Oh, I, I, I want to forget that mess, man. That's not what God is talking about." He said, "We are darkness. Every sinner is darkness. You're not partaking in darkness. The Scriptures makes it clear." When we were darkness, we were darkness. Darkness, he says, hate the light. So every person that has ever been born into this world, hate God. You're born hating God. That's just a fact. Accept it and move on. That's what the book teach. Okay, now, watch this. The Bible says, after you and I are born again, something happens. You have an unquenchable love for God, an unquenchable love for scriptures. That You want to know the two telltale signs of a true believer? It's three, really. You have a, I'm going to write it right here. One, one, you got to love. And this love is for God. That's the first and foremost. You love God and you want to please him. Two, you have a love for scripture. You have a unquenchable, undying, undeniable love for the word of God. Three, you have a love for all believers. Irrespective of where they are around the world, every time you hear about something happening to them, every time, I mean, it, it, it impact you as if it was your spouse, if it, if it was your mother, as if it was a parent, as if it was a child, it impacts you, it hurts you. You love the things that God loves. So if you want a telltale sign of what believers look like, that's what they look like. Now, why did I say that? Purpose is because you can see here. Here's a question for you. The Bible teaches that the true fate of the believer it's given once and for all. It cannot change. Why? Because it's God's fate. It don't, it don't. Can God grow? When you look at the baby Jesus Christ when he was born, the, the baby, the physical part of God grew. Did God grow? No, man, God can't grow. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if God is doing something and giving something away, can it grow? No, not to God. But yours can grow. Your faith. See, whose faith? Your faith does something. It grows. You can either get stronger faith by studying the, script, the scriptures and obedience to what you know. Or your faith will grow dim. It can grow exceedingly, or it, 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 your confidence in the word. Why? Because you begin to take the word for what God says, and it doesn't matter what you see. Here's an example. There are people who, when they read the word, <clears throat> believers I'm talking about, excuse me, and, and the Bible says God has a desire that everyone would be saved. Question is, will everyone be saved? Of course not. So when we pray, when we pray, we pray like this morning, I pray, okay? And the prayer is, Lord, save everyone. Starting today, Lord, Save them all. 
You can if you desire to. But you know what? I know, I know without a shadow of a doubt, with all my heart, that God cannot answer that prayer. So wait a minute, God can't answer a prayer for salvation for everyone? This is where scripture have to overrule your desires. I want everyone to be saved. And every true believer, knowing the truth about what's going to happen to people in the future, the lake of fire, every one of us want the same thing, especially our families, right? But why can't God answer that prayer? Because his word says that in this time right here, Wicked people are going to become more and more wicked. In preparation for what? The rapture and the future great apostasy where the church becomes the harlot, not the true church. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm talking about the, the, face, uh, the fake uh, Babylon the great the harlot where the religious group representing religion in the church, the, the false church is going to be part of that. It's going to come in the future in preparation for the Antichrist. So if God answered my prayer today and he saves everyone, will his word then that he spoke come to pass? No. Will the church then turn into a harlot? No, not God's church, the false church. Will it turn into a, no. Will the tribulation take place? No. Why? Because nobody attack Israel. You, you, you following what I'm telling you? Although you and I may want this, God cannot answer that prayer. Why not? Because the scripture says something different. It says something different. So you would have, and I would have, God violate his own word if he answered that kind of prayer. So why did you pray it? Because I've quickly followed up. Nevertheless, Father, I understand what your word says. Not what I want. May it be according to your will and your word. But I still pray for everyone. Free adventure. But I know it can't happen. So what did I do? I took my desire. I cast it away. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I agreed with God's word. That's how we're supposed to do it. Now, so my faith and your faith grows. God faith never grows. The faith that saved never grows. Your faith grows after salvation. It can grow. Why? Because you're alive. Everything about you grows. Now, look at this. Your faith grows exceedingly and something else grows. Your love of every one of you all abounds how toward each other. There you have it. Paul is giving thanks for that. So check the boxes. You got the Lord, their, their love for God is growing. Their love for scripture is growing and their love toward each other is growing so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches. Why? Because they heard it. Paul wasn't there. Paul spent very little time in Thessalonica. Then he left. But then he started hearing as people went through that town and traveled where he was. He started hearing about their faith. Why? Because they were being obedient. Now, what's my point? Where am I going with this? I want to show you this. So you see how what's happening here, the manifest. And we read this here about Jesus coming back. 
and the glory of God. And people, the problem that people have is this right here. Jesus coming back with the glory of God, which is this flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who, what? They do not know God. Paul gave thanks because you know God. But now he's saying there are people. They don't know God. Then he said, why? And he's going to take vengeance on those. See right here? This is a certain group of people. There are people who don't know God. There are people who do not obey. Obey commandments? No. Obey the gospel. The gospel says trust in Jesus Christ. But the gospel has nothing to do with whether you change your behavior. Your behavior is changed by God. It's a nature that gets changed. It's a metamorphosis. It's a caterpillar changing into a butterfly. That's how drastic the change is with the new birth. It's something that never existed before. Guess what? If the caterpillar change, if the caterpillar dies before it exits that cocoon, guess what happens? There never becomes a butterfly. The butterfly don't exist, friend. As long as the caterpillar is alive, the butterfly can not exist. And it doesn't make a difference if the caterpillar look up one day and see a butterfly flying overhead. He has no desire to go up there where the cat uh, butterfly is. Why not? Because the, he knows there's no wings on him. I'm trying to, it, it, there's a, that's how drastic the change is with the new birth. Can then the butterfly decide, you know what? I want to go back to be a caterpillar. Can he do it? No. Why? Because the butterfly never thinks like that. He now thinks like a butterfly. All right. These are going to be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power when he comes in that day. Why is he coming? He's coming to be glorified. And he's coming to be glorified. How? In his saints. That's all of us. And to be admired. So two things God is coming to do. He's coming to be glorified. Everything you see happening is for the glory of God. And he's coming to be admired from everybody. No, only from those is that word again, who believe. Do these people up here, those who don't know God, those who don't obey the gospel, do they fit down here? No. Why not? Because they don't believe. They don't believe. So it's not the same people. There's very, two very distinct groups in this world today. There are people like this, those and those who don't know God and don't obey the gospel. And then there are people like this who do believe, who do know God, who are called his saints. In the Bible, in the scriptures, this is the few. This is the many. That's what the scriptures teach. Remember Jesus talking about the straight and narrow? How many is on there? Few. The broad and wide, how many? Many. And that's just the way God sees it. And that's the way it's going to be. Will most people go to heaven? No. Unfortunately, no. Why? I don't know. I have no idea. You got to ask God. He don't explain why. He just tells us the truth about who's going and who's not. That is few and many. But he never tells us why. In detail, he tells us that they don't believe. Because our testimony among you was what? Believe. What was Paul's testimony? His testimony was none other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was the testimony. If your, your testimony is something else. If your testimony is how you lived before you got saved, 
If that's all your testimony is, friend, that ain't going to help anybody. And that ain't glorifying God. Your testimony should only be this right here. The gospel that saved you because it alone is the power of God to salvation. Now, let's go right here. This is what I want to show you. Look at look at the metamorphosis that takes place. Therefore, we also pray always for the world. No, we pray for the believers that our God would count you worthy of what this calling. How did those believers come to believe? God called them. That friend is all over the book. Especially in the book of John. The Bible says the father draw people. The Bible says, according to Jesus, that the dead and trespasses and sins are going to hear his voice. That's the calling. He calls. Why? And he fulfill all. How much? All the good pleasure of your will. No, God is not interested in doing your will. God is only interested in this calling. Why did he call you? To fulfill all the good pleasure of his own goodness and his work of faith with his own power. Who does that? God does that. Listen, he does it with every believer. If this isn't true of you, you need to examine yourself. If you find yourself doing and living the way of the caterpillar instead of the butterfly with a totally new nature, you need to examine yourself to see if you are truly in the faith, lest you fail. You don't want to fail this test. That the name, why are we doing this? Why is God doing it? That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified. Do you see and catch a theme? Behind everything God is doing, he's doing it for his own good pleasure. He's doing it to be glorified in you. He's doing it to be glorified in his saints. He, he's doing it to be admired. He's doing it to be admired. He's doing it to be glorified. He's doing it to be glorified. He's doing it for his own pleasure. He's doing it for his own goodness. Do you catch a thing here? Why is God going around saving people? To be glorified. To be admired. For his own good pleasure. For the glory of his goodness, that he may be glorified. Where does it say anything about you? It doesn't. It doesn't. Why? Because everything about a true believer is Christ in Christ alone. That's it. Go read Revelation 4 and 5. It's a picture of true worship in heaven. It's a picture of you believe it today, what you're going to do when you get there. It's not everything you're going to do. It's just a snapshot of showing true worship. Revelation 4, the whole chapter, and 5. It shows true Worship in heaven. Go see what that looked like. They give a testimony. They give a testimony. 
What does that testimony sound like? Is anybody up there saying anything about their life as a caterpillar? No. No. It never comes up. Why not? Because that's not their purpose for being there. The only thing they see is to you be glory. Why? Because you purchased us. You bought us. You fulfilled us. You gave us your goodness. And we want to glorify you. They never talk about themselves. Not once. All they say is you redeemed us. That's true worship. Singing the song, come on in. Unbelievers sing songs. A lot of those Christian artists, they're not even saved. They're just singing. What does that have to do with true worship? Nothing. Glorified. Where does God want to be glorified while we're here on this earth? In you. In you, in him. You see, God says you are a part of me. You glorify me in your life. And you being part of my body, you are glorified in me, but it's by God. It's by God. According to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now let's go look at the final segment of glory of uh, Jesus Christ being the ending. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 20, uh, chapter 1 and chapter 21. Look at this. Remember, we're talking about the fire and all that stuff. Watch. Look at what Jesus says here. We're talking about the clouds. Right? And what the clouds look like. This is Daniel being, uh, John quoting Daniel. It's, Behold, he, who's the he? The he is Jesus. And you've seen in the book of Exodus, he came with the same thing. Was Jesus there in Exodus? Of course he was. He's the only one that comes with clouds. He is coming with clouds. Now, when you read this now, having gone through the study the last few weeks, you now, when you hear clouds related to God, your thoughts now should not be some white, puffy stuff. You know exactly what that means. That's what I'm trying to tell you about Bible study. When you study the Bible properly, and you know what's being said. When you see clouds associated with Jesus Christ or God, you're never going to think the kind of clouds you see outside. When I see it, I don't. Why? Because I know what he's talking about. And you now know because you've been studying along with me. And every eye will see him. You say, how in the world is that possible? How is it not possible? You should know the answer to that right now because of this study. How? Because it's going to be total darkness. And he's not coming from the north. He's coming up. Up. So every eye will be able to see him. Plus, you're going to have cameras from the TV and all that kind of stuff, right? So everybody's going to be able to see even those who, whoa, 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 time out, man. Wait, this is in the future. 
this is in the future, even future to me and you. This is at the end of the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation period. We won't be here. These people died a long time ago, thousands of years. They who pierced him. What in the world is he talking about? Is he talking about the people who actually pierced him? I, I don't want to get bogged down in this. But you can look at this two ways. Okay? Could it mean the folks down in Hades, the people down here? Down here in, in Hades right now? Is, is that possible? That's possible. I don't think that's what he's saying. And again, this is where God don't really explain exactly what he's saying here. So I'm going to tell you that I cannot be definitive on this point. But let me sort of give you an idea of what, and here's my reason behind it. One, the book of Ecclesiastes says the dead know not what the living is doing. So, and there's another uh, uh, passage that talks about the same thing, that the dead don't know. So I would have to do this. Based on those two witnesses that know the people down in hell in Hades today will not see the second coming. Why? Because scriptures tell us that once you die, you don't know what the living is doing. That's why I can confidently uh, eliminate that. Am I being dogmatic? No. All right. What then is he believe? What is he saying? There are several people, according to the scriptures, that pierce Jesus Christ. And the Bible gives this in the book of Acts. Okay, Peter talks about it. He says it was, uh, well, let's, let's just go look at it. Well, I'm, I'm just going to, uh oh, yeah, so that you can be with me and understand exactly what I'm talking about. 